Word of God. I like hearing people read the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 6 through 11. Again, that's 2 Corinthians 11, verses 6 through 11. This is unusual, but I'm actually going to have you start it out. And then I will say the 7th, you'll say the 8th, I'll say the ninth. you'll say the 10th, and all together on the 11th. And the reason why is because verse 9 is one of the longer verses, and I don't want you to have to fumble your way through it. So if you would, again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 6 through 11, I'll help start you out, and then I'll let you go, and then I'll take over on 7. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 6 through 11. Let's start with, but through, but though I be rude, ready, begin. But though I be rude, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Altogether on the last, wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the Oh, the precious word of God. To know it how it can infect not only a man personally, but a congregation collectively. And God, how good you are to us. We thank you that you have supplied every need. And God, we just pray that as we continue throughout this evening, that you would get the glory and honor that is certainly due your name. I thank you for the, the, the music that has already been sung and, and the beautiful trio that brought forward that wonderful song. And God, I do pray that even though the singing was wonderful, that your word might be so much more wonderful in our ears. God, may you get the glory and honor, praise, and worship that is cer certainly do your name tonight. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Paul says, though, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. I'm going to stop there for a moment and park there for a minute. I want you to think about Paul, and, and, and I can't imagine that man being rude in speech. He was a man that was able to reach down to the, the lowest and preach the word, and yet able to reach to the highest. If I, I think of Mars Hills, where he sat there with the philosophers of the day, and still able to hold a conversation with them. Now, can you imagine if he were to come in very rude speech, not one of them would have listened to him. Not one of them would have taken any uh, thought of that man that came to them with the word of God. They would have, they would have thrown him out. They would have blown him off. They would have said, "He is he. Who, who is he?" But yet, interestingly enough, we see uh, in this portion of Scripture in Second Corinthians eleven, where he says, "Though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge." He was a knowledgeable man. He knew something about the Word of God. If he was taken out in the wilderness for three years, let me turn this on, brother, because I know I didn't turn it on. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Everybody else could hear me, though. Amen. He says, though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, he was, he was a knowledgeable man in the things of God. Jesus Christ himself took him out in the wilderness for about three years, we say. And in that time, we, of course, Pastor talked about the, the, uh, the Lord's table where we bring everything out, and this is our, our manner of worship. Jesus Christ himself taught him those things about how to worship and how to worship appropriately. We know he was not uh, rude in knowledge. We know he was a very knowledgeable man. Can I tell you? That's what sets Christianity apart from most other religions in this world. 
God wants us to be knowledgeable. God says the fear of God does it not bring forth knowledge? That's what my Bible says. And I don't know about yours. I hope that it does yours too. But my Bible says that He wants us to know a thing or two. He wants us to know, listen, if you don't know it, it's because you won't open it and read it. Let me say that again. If you don't know it, it's because you won't open it and read it. This is beyond any other book that we have, beyond any mathematical book, any... Uh, geometry book any any english book any history book that is a book above all books called the word of god and we are to be knowledgeable in the word of god if you would please turn with me to second peter chapter one second peter chapter one we'll be there for a little while second peter chapter one Starting in verses 2 and 3. Now, of course, we like 1, but I'm going to drop down to 2. The Bible says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge, get this, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Do you think that knowledge is important to God? Do you think that there's a reason why He tells us that we are to be knowledgeable in certain things, especially when it comes to the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord? How important it is to know that Jesus Christ lived in this world as a sinless being died on a cross for our sins, was buried for three days and rose again on the third day, giving us everlasting life. Do you think there's something that we should know about that? Do you think there's something that we should tell the people about that? Amen. If you won't amen it, I will. According to His divine power, hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How does He do it though? through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. It's the knowledge of Him. It's the knowledge of God that would uh, propel us to have all things that pertain to life and godliness. How else are you going to know what true life is about? None of us know what true life is about without the Word of God. None of us know what godliness is about without the Word of God. Can you imagine what a, a, what a pagan I would be? Some know. Amen. Some, some know. <laughs> what a pagan I would be if it weren't for the Word of God that courses in, in, in my heart. Let's, go to, let's drop down, since we're in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, let's drop down to verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, what is that next word? Let me try it again. What is that next word? Knowledge. One more time. Knowledge. Knowledge, huh? Boy, that's interesting that God desires that we add to our virtue knowledge. How important is knowledge? To God, what, what, what would you know? Well, I, I know, you know, I know how to change a tire, and I know how to change an engine, and I know how to how to sew somebody up. And I, I'm not talking; I'm just hypothetically because I tell you, I don't know how to change an engine. I know somebody that does, but I do not. But I know how to suture somebody up. I, you know, I, I know how the body runs. I know. Listen, but do I really know it? Not outside the Word of God. This is, this is where we find true knowledge. This is where we find all truth. Not just knowledge, but truth in itself. But he goes on to say in verse 6, and to knowledge temperance. And that's an interesting statement. I hope everybody knows what temperance is. First off, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Is it not? It's, has anybody ever been told, hold your temper? Hey, who here has never been told, hold your temper? Amen. Okay. So you all know what I'm talking about. Mama about ready to slap you and she says, you better hold your temper, boy. 
Amen. Can I tell you that we have enough knowledge to make us deadly? Let me say that again. We have enough knowledge to make us deadly. How can I say that? Well, let me ask you. And I'm going to ask for a show of hands. I don't think anybody can see it online. So I'm going to ask you, who here knows how to fire a weapon? Okay. Now let me put it to you this way. If you were very short-tempered and you had a very short fuse and you had that weapon on you, how deadly does that make you? I, I know myself. I may not know all of you. But if you had that short fuse and you had a weapon on you, how deadly does that make you? You have just enough knowledge to make you deadly without temperance. Let's continue on to verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, <clears throat> For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these things be in you, well, what things is he talking about? That list that I just went through previously about having, uh, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, and patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Those are what he's talking about. Having knowledge of those things, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mind you, that's an important statement. The, the last three words is a very important statement. We went over that in Bible study yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, about how important those three words put together, the Lord Jesus Christ is. How many times is it taken, if you, we talked about the new Bibles, and how many times that is either split up or taken out completely in that context? Let us never forget, He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord of our life. He is Savior of our life. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. He doesn't desire that we be barren or unfruitful. This is why the fruit of the Spirit should be uh, basically easy fruit to pick, shall I say. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. What is that last word? Temperance. Against such there is no law. These ought to be low-hanging fruit, as Pastor would say. Something that people ought to be able to see without having to really look in. I don't know about you, but when I go to a, an apple tree, I'm, I'm expecting things to be hanging down. I'm expecting those apples to be laying low. But if I have to go searching in that bush to find, or in that tree to find them, or if I got to go picking berries and I got to go searching those pricker bushes, hey, can I tell you that's no fun? Nobody likes to be pricked. But anyway, I digress. It hurts, doesn't it? God doesn't desire us to be hurt to find that fruit. It should be shown right out there that it may be easily plucked, that other people might know who you are and what you believe. Amen. Second Peter chapter two in verse twenty. Second Peter chapter two and verse twenty. Second Peter verse two, or, or I'm sorry, chapter two and verse twenty. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Verse 21. For if it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, then after they have known it, to turn from holy commandment delivered unto them. He doesn't, he's not saying that you should not be saved. He's not saying you should not accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. But what he is saying is if you decide to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and yet you decide to continue in your way and go even worse, it, the, 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 the end of it is worse for you than not hearing the gospel. Now, physically, in this world, that is true. But, can I tell you, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. 
When you stand in judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if I'm not mistaken, Revelation chapter 19 talks about those that end up in the lake of fire. I think that that is much worse than had it been that they didn't hear it. I don't know about you, I, I, I know people that have done that. I know people that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. We're on fire for God! And then let it all go. Said, I'll have none of that. They got angry at God is what happened. They got angry at God at their circumstance, thinking He's a genie in the bottle. Thinking He's going to change everything at my whim. Whatever I think should be done, and if it's not done in my time, then God, who are you? And then they walk away saying, I don't, who is this God? And if you look at their life today, oh, it may look all sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. It may look like they're having a great time, but I can tell you on the inside, in that heart, you have no idea the stirring that is going on in there. They know better. And I do believe that it is killing them on the inside, no matter how many smiles they have on their faces. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Peter 3.18, the very last verse of 2 Peter. The Bible says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. God doesn't desire us to lay stagnant. And He doesn't desire us to die off. He wants us to continue to grow. And grow not only in grace, but also in the knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The only knowledge I have of Him is what I have in this book right here. That's the only knowledge I have. That's, that's the only way I can gain or, or glean knowledge is by the Word of God. Anybody else know Him personally without knowing the Word of God? Anybody else can tell me anything about Him without knowing the Word of God? I've never met the man. I, I've never seen him. I couldn't tell you him from Adam, honestly. There will come a day I will. But until that, until that time, I, I, I can't tell you much about him without the Word of God. How important is it to grow? We, we, I remember this song. Uh, um, how's it go? Uh, yeah, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Anybody remember that? If you don't, uh, now you heard it. Amen. Amen. Don't read your Bible, forget to pray. What happens? You shrink, shrink, shrink. That's not what God wants. That's, that's not what His Word tells us to do. It says grow! Not to shrink. Why would we desire to shrink? We're, I mean, physically, we're going to shrink anyway. Anybody ever notice that your, your stature goes down, down, down? Amen? But that's not what He wants for... What's that? What did I miss? Poor Joe. Poor Joe. <laughs> I didn't say it, Joe. That's, just remember that. Until I said it, until I heard him say it, then I said it. But anyway, I digress. He desires us to continue to grow in our in grace and knowledge, not in stature. This is going to disintegrate. Everybody know that. Everybody know this turns back to dust as it once came. The word of God says so. This isn't going to live forever, but what lies within me will. What I get judged for will. That is what I will be standing in account for is what I have before me. And he's going to say, you remember when you didn't open it? You remember when you didn't have anything to do with that word? Do you remember that you accepted me, but yet you didn't want anything really to do with me? You wouldn't go to the house of God to hear the word of God being preached. You wanted nothing to do with 
being around other brothers and sisters in Christ. Someday we will stand in account for that. What we've done in this body, whether it be good or evil. Actually, I think it says good or bad, but I think it's pretty synonymous. But we need to grow. We, we, we don't need to be stagnant. We don't need to, to let things go. Don't say, it's somebody else's job. It's your job. God has given you a job to do, and He expects you to do it. And you will be held accountable. Otherwise, you'll be called an unprofitable servant, and I don't want to be there. I want somebody to tell me that I'm going to be profit. I want, I want to hear from the, from the mouth of Jesus Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee rule over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I hope you want to hear that too. But He will not tell you that if you are not that because He cannot lie. That's what my Bible says. I've only gotten through one verse. <laughs> Amen. And where am I? Alright, we got ten minutes. You can hang out with me for ten minutes. Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 11, 7 says this. I'm going to have you turn as I go to that to Matthew chapter 10. But... 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 says, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? If you would, again, I ask Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. Matthew 10 and verse 8. <clears throat> Jesus Himself says these words. He's talking to His disciples that He has sent out two by two. Mind you, there's something special about that. There's something specific about that. And I'll get to that momentarily. But Matthew 10.8 says this. Turn my page. Heal the sick. Actually, let me back up to verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. This is the part I want you to get. Freely ye have received, freely give. How important is that to a Christian? You know, we have these wonderful things called Bible tracts. But can I tell you, you can do it cheaper than that. You can do it cheaper than that. What do I mean? It's called word of mouth. Anybody ever heard of it? A anybody ever heard of, of opening your mouth and talking to somebody? Instead of sitting back and, and you know, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? First off, they're never going to see again, and if they do, they could care less anyway. We have received something freely. It's called the gift of life. Of everlasting, not just gift of life, everlasting life. Eternal life. That is a free gift that has been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've accepted and received Him. If you believe Him. But if you don't, then there's no gift. You've, you've rejected it. But if you've accepted it, if you've received it, if you believe it, you have the gift of life. He says, you've been given it to you freely, now so give it freely. That means tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. That means let them know your testimony of how Jesus changed your life, what He did for you. Instead of standing back and saying, oh, I don't know, what are they going to say about me? What are they going to think? Quit worrying about what they think. Worry about their soul. Worry about everlasting life in their life. Tell them you want to see them in heaven. What's wrong with that? How hard is that? Hey, I don't know about you, but I want to see you in heaven. Can I tell you how I know I'm going? I can tell you how to, too. How hard is that? Honestly, it is harder than we think. Why? Because we're worried about ourselves. We're worried about what they think of us. 
We're worried about what they're going to say about us. About, do you hear that Jesus freak? What's wrong with him? You believe that, that Bible thumper? I mean, come on. You really believe that stuff? Can I tell you, yes, I do. And why should I stand back and say, I don't know, you know. No. Listen, my Bible says in the book of Acts, when they received the Holy Spirit, they were going boldly with the Word of God. Why don't we? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Let me ask that to start with. Let's, let's, let's step back for a second. Let's, let's do some introspection and say, do I have the Holy Spirit in me? Why am I not going boldly with the Word of God? Why am I not telling people about Jesus Christ? Can I tell you, I struggle with the very same things you do. I do. So don't think I'm yelling at you saying, I'm no Superman. And I, no, I struggle with it too. And it kills me. I'm just as human as you are. I feel the same things. But I know what God's Word says. And I know what I need to do. Now it's just getting to it. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Now I hope you know 3.23, but we're going a, a verse past that. Romans 3.24. Who does not know Romans 3.23? Don't raise your hand. In fact, that's one of the, one of the most famous verses we use for soul winning. And it goes something like this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When it says all, it means all. It means every person that's ever lived in this world except for one. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that that does not pertain to. But everybody else in this world, that word pertains to everybody. But we're going to verse 24. I didn't mean to stop there and preach, but let's continue. Being justified, what is that next word? Freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's free redemption waiting for you. Who knows what redemption means? I hope you know what redemption means. It means to, to hand something in to gain something back. In New York State, we have the five cent things on your bottles or cans, and you can take them to the redemption center, and you can hand in that piece of can or whatever it is, and they give you five cents back. That trash for treasure, shall I say. This life is trash, but he's got treasure waiting for you. Being justified freely by his grace. For by grace are you saved through faith in it, not of yourselves, and it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That gift is redemption. I, I hand in my trash that I have here, and he gives me something so much greater. Better than five cents, let me tell you. Well, in Revelation chapter 21. You can't tell I'm fired up. If you can tell, praise the Lord. Hope you are too. I told Pastor, I said, every time he stands up to say, please open your word of God, we go, Amen! We ought to. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with praising the Lord for the goodness he's given us in his word? Like I said, how else are you going to know what salvation, redemption, sanctification, how are you going to know any of that stuff without opening the word of God? without coming to hear the Word of God being preached and explain some things to you, or even questions given to you. He's good at that. I don't know a Hujo. Uh, I've heard of Cujo, but never Hujo. So, <laughs> Amen. Revelation 21, verse 6. The Bible says, And he said unto me, well, say these next three words with me. It is done. Something similar to what I understand was said on the cross. Very similar. At that time, he said it's finished. But now, he says something a little bit different. But just as much power to it. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, 
the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. What is that last word? Freely. Freely. He's desiring that you have, that you, since you have received the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ your Lord, that you give it freely. He desires that being justified freely by His grace, that you would also extend that grace to somebody else. Now He says, to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life, He gives it freely. How about you? But I get thirsty quickly. This is why I love something to drink. There's nothing like a good cold glass of water on a hot day after you've been working hard, after you've been out there slaving. It's nothing like a good old-fashioned glass of cold water. But can I tell you that even Jesus said, the water I have for you comes from somewhere else. And no man thirsteth after I give him that water. Because I remember the water that the woman at the well desired, and it wasn't that water to start with. She desired the water out of that well, that cold glass. But can I tell you that the water that comes from the fountain of life, His name is Jesus Christ. The water that comes from Him, oh, is so much sweeter, so much colder. So much more wonderful than what we could ever imagine here in this world. I don't know about you, but I look forward to seeing that fountain that comes from the throne of God. But can I tell you, I've already tasted that. That fountain, that sweet water, it's called salvation. It's merely a taste of what truly is awaiting us. It's merely a taste of what we can have. But you have to accept it. Now you could, I mean, David did it reverently and he took that glass of water and he says, I will not put these men's lives in vain. And he poured out a drink offering to God. This he wants us to partake of. This is salvation that He desires that we all partake of. Because He did have to go through... Yes, He was God. I understand that. But physically, He went through a lot to get to that point that we could drink of that fountain. Lastly, if you would, the Revelation 22.17. 22.17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, what is that next word? Come. And let him heareth say, if you would, the last word, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will. Don't ever forget that. Whosoever will. Let him take the water of life. What is that last word? Freely. Have you taken of the water of life? He's asking you to come. He, and in fact, the, the bride and the Spirit are asking you to come. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's your invitation. He says, come. Take of the water freely. Partake of what, what is so much greater and better than anything in this world. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your treasure today? I mentioned it earlier uh, at, at Farmersville. I said, uh, talking about redemption. And I said, you know, how many people want to hold on to everything they have in this world? I said, but if you give it up, you don't have to. You, you're you're free. 
You, you, don't have, you don't have to pay taxes on it anymore. Amen. Get rid of your car. Get rid of your house. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. Please don't get me wrong. But what I am saying is if you didn't have it, you don't have to pay for it anymore. It's just like your life. If you give it to Christ, there's no more payment. He's already paid for it. It's already done. You just have to partake of the goodness that He has for you. I don't know about you, but I'd rather the goodness of God than the goodness of what this world has for me. Because what this world has is nothing but heartache and difficulties and struggles and work. That horrible four-letter word that nobody likes. That's what this world holds. But there's something so much better that is awaiting us. He's given you an invitation. He says, come. He desires that you be there. I want you there as well. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, you won't be there. But I can tell you, if you do, if you've accepted that gift of eternal life, oh, glory that will be. When my Jesus, I shall see. When I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, the one who takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Heavenly Father, thank You again for the precious Word of God. Thank You again for the promises that You have given us. We thank You, Lord, for the knowledge, for the brains to even have the knowledge. And God, thank you for the word of God that gives us knowledge. Again, Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Oh, we thank you for the long suffering, Lord, how long you've suffered over us. But even so, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the good and perfect gifts. We thank you for the provision of each and every day, and I thank you for my brothers and sisters that have desired to come to hear the Word of God being preached. I do pray, Lord, that all that was said and done behind this pulpit tonight would bring glory and honor to you, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.